Well, I'll, I'll give you one example. So um, one common investment fraud is the pyramid scheme, which involves wild promises of profitability um, and, and then initially delivering on those promises by uh, taking the money that later investors put in and, and using that to pay off the dividends to early investors. And of course, this can, can't, can't last forever because eventually you run out of people at the bottom of the pyramid. Um, one of the, uh, so the, the actual form of that is, is very consistent, but so is the mode of marketing. In almost all of these types of schemes, the, the, the approach is to look for some group of insiders and to have someone in that group. Uh, almost all of the, the, the schemes are perpetrated by, by individuals who can expect to have trust because they are selling this scheme to people like them who are distinct from, from the rest of society. So the, the most famous example of this probably still, uh, maybe Madoff is, is dislodging it, is the Ponzi scheme. That's why we, we call it a Ponzi scheme. Charles Ponzi operated this in Boston in the early 1920s. And he focused on the Italian community, which is what he came from. Um, but the earliest example that I know is a, a scheme by a woman, actually, Sarah Howe, in the 1870s in Boston, and, and she focused on unmarried women. Bond of trust. I'm unmarried, you're unmarried, uh, and there are Quakers who've given me resources that enable me to, to uh, make good on my promises of wild investment returns. And once that then starts going, the, the chief marketers of the scheme, it's not advertising, it's word of mouth. And that is a, that is a, a pattern that has recurred right up to our time. Yeah, I was struck by uh, the persistence of affinity fraud, which you just mentioned without calling it that, um, that uh, Ponzi marketed to Italians when Italians were a, you know, very much a ethnic minority, somewhat isolated, did not feel particularly well served by the institutions of society. Um, uh, even Madoff. Madoff right. largely um, pr uh, marketed what he was doing to Jews. In the early phases particularly. In, yeah, in the early phases particularly. But the um, subprime mortgage market, uh, subprime mortgage lending was largely affinity, affinity fraud uh, directed uh, specifically at communities of color, um, African Americans. It was really lower, lower middle class homeowners generally, uh, but in the African American community and in the Latino community, uh, it was mortgage brokers who looked like them, uh, and they did not feel that they had been well served over time by traditional financial institutions, banks. Uh, they didn't trust them, uh, and when someone came to them uh, and they needed to borrow money, and the only way they could really borrow money was by borrowing against their home because they did have equity in their home, when someone says, um, we're alike, uh, you can't trust the people that you would otherwise have to deal with, I know the stuff, I can help you. Um, that, was, uh, that was a well-trod path in the history of fraud. Yeah, and just to, just to echo some of these things, uh, a, a lot of these scams are, are based in some way. There's a story behind them. There's a psychological element. They're targeting people who are susceptible to certain types of scams. There, you know, there are scams that um, try to take advantage of people's desire to hit it big. And so there's the scam where you're told you've won the sweepstakes, and, but you, if you, you have to pay a small fee to get your, you know, get your winnings. And that's been around for a long time, only now you get that from an email you know, on, on the internet as opposed to someone in person uh, telling letter. you that. Or a letter, letter, right. Or, or there's the one that tries to prey upon people's desire to help other people. So hence the, the, the email you get from the Nigerian prince, or, or, or it might be you know, a, a new wrinkle on that scam, might be a different type of prince. And, and, and again, and, and earlier um, versions of that type of story um, would, have, would have involved a different story with different details, but again, it's premised on trying to prey on people's desire to help other people. And, and, and it's very sad, but that's, that, that's where a lot of these things come from. And, and related to that, and, and I always find this to be um, extremely sad and frustrating as someone who works on a daily basis in the fraud world, um, some of the, 
the, the, the scams that are really disheartening or the scams that arise, uh, charities related scams, whenever there's a natural disaster, you know, such as Hurricane Matthew. And we, we know that these things happen in the wake of a natural disaster. We know that there will be false charities that come out trying to get people to donate money to them. So one of the first things we do is try to get the word out and try to warn people to do their research and not fall for scams like that. But, but those are some of the, the worst types of scams, I think, where people are really hit hard, they're, they're, they're in trouble, and then out comes you know, a scam to try to take advantage of it and make it even, even worse. And again, things like that have been going on uh, for, for a long time, but the details change, the technology changes. And, and, and if anything, sometimes technology makes prevalence of these scams and the difficulty fighting, fighting them even, um, even, even more difficult because then it becomes harder sometimes to track down the scammer because they might not even be in your community. You know, they might be overseas and the scam is being conducted over the internet or over the telephone. And so technology is great in a lot of ways, but it, 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 it's, it, it can, you know, make, uh, make it easier for the scam, scammers to perpetuate their scams as well. Let well, me mention um, one other uh, pattern that has persisted, and that is the tendency to blame the victim for being incautious, uh, for being foolish. A fool and his money is soon parted. Um, that that would never have happened to you. Uh, you should feel smug and superior, and you should not feel sympathetic to the guy who got hoodwinked because he was not careful in the way that you would have been. He was a sucker. <laughs> he was a sucker. Um, you, you mentioned the, um, I think in the first chapter, the, the tendency to kind of, uh, it was, it was um, uh, Barnum who kind of made himself this enduring, uh, this endearing uh, scoundrel uh, with his tales of how he had suckered people, but the, the, the popular culture figure that I thought of was W.C. Fields. Mm. Uh, in his three war rules of life, if I, let me make sure I can get these right. Um, never give a sucker an even break. You can't cheat an honest man. And never smarten up a chump. Uh, and the, the sense that you would not have been cheated, that the person who was cheated would not have been cheated had they not been trying to get something they should have known better, they should not have tried to get and should have known better and known that they were being cheated. Um, uh, and, it, and it was their own fault. And that, and that also makes them feel ashamed. People feel, people feel more ashamed of their financial circumstances than anything else. And, uh, and being hoodwinked uh, really makes, makes people not come forward. You, you also point that out in the book. How, many, how few victims of fraud actually complain about it? So this is a key element of the long-standing, centuries-old argument for caveat emptor. Mm -hmm. All of those principles for W.C. Fields are, are key elements of the argument that really the best public policy is, is, to, is to create incentives for people to look out for themselves. Right. Uh, because if you, if you protect them too much, then, then they won't do that. And that's really the best, the best antidote to these types of deceptive practices is, is to have people wisen up and, and, and be careful and vigilant. The, the problem that with that argument, and this is, I think, why uh, we see a growth in uh, uh, more stringent regulatory protections for consumers and investors from the late 19th century in well through m most of the 20th, is that in a modern, uh, a modern capitalist society, the gaps in information between, uh, between sellers and buyers are often so great yeah, and that, that it's, it's just a, a structural problem. And, where I, and what made me think of that was my experience in working on, on, on mortgages, where the argument was, well, they should have read their mortgage. They should have known what kind of mortgage they were signing. Like, who reads selling me? You go to closing your hand or a sack of documents like this, or these little yellow stickies to the side saying, sign here, sign here, sign here. <laughs> who the hell reads their mortgages? Um, it's like the TV ad um, by one of the insurance companies. Like, um, did you read page five? No, only lawyers do that. No, but, and, and it's, believe me, it's much worse for, uh, for mortgages. And what's the opportunity of cost to that for society if everybody, every consumer in America is reading their mortgages and their mutual fund statements and their credit card bills and, and all the insurance contracts and, and on and on? Uh, well, just, to, I, I, just to echo that, I, I read a book recently all about disclosures, and one of the authors of the book did a video on YouTube, printed up uh, the the 
the terms and conditions from an internet company and, and, it and he printed it up physically. You know, this is something that normally you're just looking at on the internet, scrolling through and clicking and it says you've read all the terms and conditions. He actually printed it out and it stretched from, you know, the second or third story of the library in his building and was, you know, numerous feet long. And, and, and again, uh, who, who reads that? 